So in this chapter, we're going to deal with the concept of mapping. And mapping is a lot of different things in Maxwell. It can be used for virtually every function that you have in the material editor. So there's a lot to cover. And I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible so that we can just focus in on what each function does and not so much all of the possibilities because truly the possibilities are almost limitless with Maxwell because you can have a map in nearly every slot and they all do different things. When we work with maps, though, it's important to note that in Maxwell, it must be a raster graphic, meaning it needs to be made out of pixels because vector graphics are not supported currently in Maxwell. And Maxwell doesn't currently have any procedural textures. So if you want to create any kind of textures or any type of bitmap type looking stuff, you're going to need to use a program like Photoshop or GIMP or Corel Painter in order to create something that you can actually then output. And I tend to prefer to save my bitmap images that I'm going to use as maps as a ping format or PNG. There's a lot of good reasons why I choose to do that, but generally speaking, probably the best reason that I can think of for using PNGs is because they're basically universal. Almost every web browser, almost every operating system can see a PNG just like it'd see a JPEG. However, JPEGs have nasty artifacts that come from the compression algorithm, which PNGs do not. The other thing that's really nice about PNGs is that you can have 16-bit grayscale files. And that's really important when you're dealing with mapping because you never know when and where you're going to want to use a map. And for certain functions, it's going to be very important to have 16-bit depth for your grayscale files. Now, that said, oftentimes we're going to want to use color. And in color, you know, 16-bit for the most of the applications that we're going to use color for, probably not going to be so important. But I'll point those things out to you as we come to them. By and large, though, these are the maps that we're going to be talking about here. And you can see I start with this color gradient. And then we have a simple grayscale gradient. And then I have a radial gradient. Then I have this concentric circle gradient. Some fans, some checkerboards, some stripes, and then I've got some photos. And this by far is the most popular way to use maps in Maxwell. It does have some pitfalls that I'll talk about here in just a second. Let's go ahead and take a look at this other one. Both of these we'll be using, and they're really good photographs for 3D, which isn't surprising considering they were provided for free as part of a package that NVIDIA releases to everyone for free on its website. These other photos that you see back here are from Maxwell's sort of default library that comes with Maxwell. They're more or less just samples. They really highlight something that I think is really a problem when dealing with photos as your mapping source, and that is what's called baked in lighting. What that means when they say baked in is that when the photo was taken, there was already some light that was part of the photo. So like, for instance, in this particular photo, you can see there's a shadow at the tops of these little crevices, and then there's a highlight at the bottom. Well, that's great, and it looks good for a photo. But when you go to put that into your 3D scene and you go to light it, your lighting may not agree with the baked in lighting. Now, if you're doing video games or something like that where you don't have full-on rendering like you would in Maxwell, then baked-in lighting is a good thing. However, in a program like Maxwell, where you have absolutely perfect control over light, you really don't want to have any baked-in lighting into your photos. It's really not a good thing. Now, this leaf here is another good example of that baked-in lighting. You can see how there's some light catching these parts of the leaves and then it's going into shadow. And again, that's going to interfere with our ability to realistically light this leaf. These rocks here are a little bit better, but still you can see that there's some crevices and shadows and highlights that you're going to have to fight a little in order to create 
your material from these photos. And by and large, that's my number one rule when it comes to using photos for mapping in Maxwell is to try to find photos that have the least amount of baked in lighting you possibly can. Now, if you're a photographer, which I'm not, and you have a good camera equipment, then I would highly recommend that you also invest a lot of time and energy into getting your lighting setups correct so that you can capture photos that have the least amount of baked in lighting possible. Now, another option is to purchase maps that you can get from various different companies, one of which is Arroway. And of course, you can see some of the Arroway sample maps in the library that comes with Maxwell. It's kind of stripped down in the sense that the real Arroway maps are much higher resolution, but you get an idea of what I mean when I say that those are generally speaking better quality maps than you're likely to find just doing an image search on the internet or something like that. And they do cost money. They're, they're not cheap. But at the same time, you're going to find them to be a lot more useful for a lot of situations. And of course, they're really going to take advantage of the way that Maxwell works. That said, let's go ahead and start diving into how we would apply these maps in Maxwell.